Okay, Proverbs 22, verse 9, got that out of the way, uh, in the English Standard Version is what I've been using for the last year or so. I was using New King James quite a bit, I'll probably go back to that uh, after a little while, but right now it's ESV. The scripture says, whoever has a bountiful eye will be blessed, for he shares his bread with the poor. Whoever has a bountiful eye will be blessed, for he shares his bread with the poor. So, um, just kind of way of introduction, Proverbs was written, uh, most of it was written by a guy named Solomon. If not, uh, um, he, if he didn't write it, he collected it. Uh, Solomon was the son of David through Bathsheba. Um, and if you don't know what happened there, uh, David had an illicit uh, uh, encounter with Bathsheba, who was the wife of one of his mighty men. Uh, she ended up getting pregnant. He killed, he had her husband killed, married her, cover up his sin. It was exposed. The baby that they had died. Uh, but then they, they had another baby, and this one was blessed of the Lord. And it, God is so good and merciful, he actually uh, 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 named Solomon, which was the product of this, uh, uh, the second baby, the product of their uh, marriage, uh, to be the next king after David. So anyway, um, um, God turned the situation around. The child born to them was selected by God to be the next king of the Israelites, Solomon being young in age, whenever it was time for him to ascend the throne, asked God for the divine gift of wisdom. And God, being pleased with his request, gave it to him. So in the book of Proverbs, we have collected, as well as Ecclesiastes. If you ever read Ecclesiastes, that's a good book as well. You have to understand when you go into Ecclesiastes, well, I'm giving you a lot of information today. I don't know why I'm doing that. But uh, when you read Ecclesiastes, Solomon is writing from the perspective of someone that's trying to figure out life a wise man figuring out life apart from God. So a lot of times, that's where context is important. If you read Ecclesiastes, you say, well, it's in the Bible. Now, remember, it's in the Bible, but you got to know what the context is. Solomon's trying to figure out life apart from God. But in the end, he basically says, without God, everything's meaningless. What makes life meaningful is God. Okay? Well, anyway, he also wrote Proverbs. And in the book of Proverbs, he has... Uh, a lot of uh, really uh, uh, tidbits of wisdom that are just nuggets that you can you can chew on. And um, in the we have in this book of Proverbs, we have collected a great many of the kernels of wisdom God had given them over the years. Today, we're just going to focus on one of them. And what was the scripture? Whoever has a bountiful eye will be blessed, for he shares his bread with the poor. So the first point we're going to look at is what does he mean when he says "eye"? What does the eye? in this verse represent. Well, the Hebrew word translated I is the word ayin, A-Y-I-N. That's not how you spell it, it's how we transliterate it. More than the I itself is in, implied by this word. Occasionally, what it represents is the whole process of seeing and by extension, understanding and obedience. Jeremiah 5.21 says, Hear this, O foolish and senseless people who have eyes but do not see. Now, they're not blind, but they have eyes, but do not see. Really, the context is they have eyes, but they don't perceive. They have ears, but they hear not. So here, Jeremiah states that the people, although physically able to see and hear, spiritually, they're dull and senseless. So we see that the eye can be used to express more than the physical and the natural senses. It's used to express knowledge, character, attitude, inclination, opinion, passion, and response. In other words, the eye and what it represents is a good barometer of the inner thoughts of a person. Therefore, if the eye represents how a person understands or thinks, then what we're really talking about here in this verse is a way of looking at life. We might go so far as to say that the eye represents the filter or the lens that we see life through. See, if you're an atheist, you see through a lens that there is no God. And everything you see is filtered through that lens. So a person that believes in God can see something and they can interpret and perceive God in that where a person that is an atheist, they can look at the same thing and perceive that there is no God. They're looking at the same thing, but how they see and how they perceive is determined by the filter that they have. 
right? So in this particular case, the eye represents the filter or the lens that we can see life through. Now, now, the, but the scripture is, just, is not just talking about the eye. The scripture says whoever has a bountiful eye. So what kind of, of eye is it? The eye that we're talking about or the frame of reference or the filter that we're talking about is a bountiful eye. The text says that he who has a bountiful eye will be blessed. The word used to describe the eye which we now have come to understand as a way of looking at life, is the adjective bountiful. What does the word bountiful mean? What word was it translated from? Well, it comes from the Hebrew word tob, T-O-B. That's not how you spell it in Hebrew. That's how we transliterate it. The Hebrew lexicon defines the word as having desirable or positive qualities, especially those suitable for a thing specified, pleasant, agreeable or good. So we see that the word tov has a variety of meanings, but the best way to understand a word is from the context that it's placed in. So how do the other translations that I was talking about before render this word? How do they translate this word into English? The New King James, uh, the, what I was reading is ESV, says whoever has a bountiful life. New King James translates it, he who has a generous I. Uh, the new I, NIV, New International Version, says the generous will themselves be blessed. So it understands bountiful and translated, it translates it as generous. The New Living Translation says blessed are those who are generous because they feed the poor. So all these other translations define the word tob as having a meaning of generosity or, or being generous. So the understanding so far is that the person who has an outlook on life that sees through a bountiful eye or a lens of generosity will act in such a way that reflects that outlook in life by the things that they do. With that in mind, and this is just a lot of, I know it's a lot of information, but, but I hope it'll, it'll coalesce when we get to the end here. With that in mind, today, I'm still going to use the translation that says bountiful because I want to bring something out through that understanding. That's why I picked the ESC version when I use it as our text. So to recap, you can forget about everything that I've said and just recap here. <coughs> Whoever has a bountiful eye is someone who has the understanding that there is plenty more where that came from, Okay. We might say to ourselves, well, if I was wealthy, there would be plenty more where that came from. But that's not really what we're talking about. You see, you can be wealthy and still not have a bountiful eye. Right? So let's remind ourselves that we're not talking about how much you have. What we're talking about is how you perceive life, how you understand how you look at life. We're talking about a perspective on life. We're talking about a mentality that looks at life without the idea that's not, that there's not enough to go around. They look at life and they realize there's more where that came from. Oftentimes, looking at the opposite of something helps to bring a greater understanding to the perspective you're trying to define. So what is the opposite of bounty? Bounty means abundance, right? In my mind, it would be the idea of lack. Since we're talking about an understanding or an outlook on life, we could define the opposite of a bountiful eye as a poverty eye. Or we might just say someone who has a poverty mentality. All right? A way of looking at life that there's never going to be enough. Proverbs 30, 21 through 23 says, Under three things the earth trembles, under four it cannot bear up. A slave when he becomes king, a fool when he is filled with food, an unloved woman when she gets a husband, and a maidservant when she displaces her mistress. Now the reason I use the whole thing and not just the one particular verse that I'm going to concentrate on is because if you look at these in context, a fool when he is filled with food 
is still a fool. But now he's, there's nothing to, there's nothing in him that is needing to change anything about his situation or how he thinks. An unloved woman, when she gets a husband, even though she has a husband, she's still unloved in her mind. A maidservant, when she displaces her mistress, in other words, she now becomes the person in charge, even though she's a mistress, she's still going to think like a maidservant. All right, that's the context of what we're looking at here. So the one we want to focus on is a slave when he becomes a king. Now, we got to ask ourselves, how does a, th- a slave think? Well, let's, let's go back and recognize this. A slave has nothing. A slave possesses nothing, but a slave is a possession of someone. A slave has nothing, possesses nothing, oftentimes barely has enough to live on, much less anything to give away. A slave has, in general, we're not saying you can't not have that, but a slave in general, and how we're looking at things today, has a poverty mentality. Why? Because they grow up knowing there's not enough to go around. So, with a poverty mentality, what does somebody think? Uh, What does a slave think? How do they live? I have to do everything I can to get as much as I can and to keep what I have from anybody else that may try to get what I have. Do I need to repeat that? Did we get that? Okay. So what this verse in Proverbs uh, chapter 30 is showing us is that a person can become a king, but if a slave becomes a king, he's not going to change his way of thinking. He's just going to have more. But he's still going to think like a slave. And the outward position will betray the inner person. A king, by the very definition of a king, owns everything in the land. A king has an abundance. But the inner world of that person who has a slave or poverty mentality will not act like a king who has an abundance but will act like a slave. He will use his power not to give and not to bless, but instead he will use his power to protect and to take and to hoard. So instead of being there to be a blessing to the people, he uses his position and power to get as much as he can for himself. It kind of reminds you of some of what's happening in our uh, current government administration right now. It's not about being a blessing to the people. It's about uh, forget the people. Let me see what I can get for myself. It doesn't matter how much money you have in the bank. It's a, it's, it, to me, it is a re- revealing a, a corruption, greed, but much of that stems from a poverty mentality. Okay. So what we're talking about is not a position, but a lens, a way of looking at life. It has nothing to do with who you are or how much you have in the bank. It has everything to do with how you think. (coughs) Excuse me. When the Israelites came out of Egypt, what did they come out with? Remember, they were slaves. But did they come out with nothing? No, they came out with an abundance, Exodus 3, 21 through 22. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and when you go, you shall not go empty. But each woman shall ask of of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing, and you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, and so you shall plunder the Egyptians." That's what God commanded them to do. And in Exodus 12, it says what they did, 35 through 36, they asked the Egyptians for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing, and the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have what they asked, and thus they plundered the Egyptians. Now, I want to tell you something. They came out with great wealth. They didn't come out 
with little trinkets. They came out with an abundance. But even though they came out with incredible wealth, they still acted as if they were slaves. During their wilderness wanderings, God provided for their needs by raining down bread from heaven to feed them. The whole multitude of the people he fed for a period of 40 years. And he did so without fail. Exodus 16, 4, and then we'll jump down to verse 35. It should be up there. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. And then verse 35, the people of Israel ate the manna, and with the understanding, the bread that fell from heaven, they ate the manna that came with a dew every morning for 40 years. Millions of people, without fail, fed every day for 40 years. What was that supposed to teach them? That he's our provider. That there's always going to be enough. Right? But what we find is that this whole time, whenever God fed them every day, what they were supposed to learn about God, they actually learned nothing. They said, thank you, God. What do you do for me lately? Because every time they went through something, they didn't say, well, God's our provider. He's provided for us in the past. He will provide for us again. They grumbled and complained and said, oh, we're going to die in the wilderness. Give us meat. Thank you. That's a good segue for my next part here. So Exodus 16, 4, and then uh, uh, I already read that. So during those times, uh, the, the people also had a craving for meat. So God, just like he had done with the manna, <clears throat> said he would rain down quail for the people to eat. Now, we're gonna, <laughs> think about this. Millions of people, some people estimate 2 million people in the wilderness. And God said, I'm going to give you quail every day. For 30 days. Every day. So, remember what he said about the manna? Every day, the manna's going to be there. What did he tell the Israelites? Every day, for 30 days, you're going to get up, and you're going to see quail, and there's going to be enough for you for the day. All right. So you would think to yourself, okay, God's faithful. He said there's going to be manna. There was manna. He said there's going to be quail. So we know we'll get what we need today because it's going to be quail tomorrow. Why? Because God said every day for 30 days there's going to be quail. Is that what they did? No. Right? So what he, what, uh, um, they didn't have, because he was going to give it every day, they weren't going to have to hoard it. What they needed would be provided, yet what we see them doing when the quail came is this. In Numbers 11, 32 through 33, and the people rose all that day and all that night and all the next day, and they gathered the quail. Those who gathered least gathered 10 homers. We're not talking about Homer Simpson. They gathered 10 homers, and they spread them out for themselves all around the camp. While the meat was still between their teeth, before it was consumed, the anger of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord struck down the people with a very great plague. Now, I used to wonder about this. Why is God providing for the people, and the people are getting what God provided, and then he gets mad about it? Well, because you've got to understand what exactly they were doing. See, the problem is we don't understand what an omer is. It's kind of like some of y'all, when you cook, you don't understand what a teaspoon is. Get a whole thing in there. You put it in there. It's a, <laughs> it said, I don't think that's a teaspoon. Oh, yeah, that's a teaspoon. And you measure it out. That's like 10 teaspoons, right? We don't understand what an omer. An omer is a measurement. But remember, God said, I'm going to provide quail for you every day for a month. He's faithful in the past. He'll be faithful again. Yet what they did was when the quail came, instead of trusting God who provided today to provide us again tomorrow, what they did is they began to hoard the quail at that particular moment. Why do I say they hoarded it? Well, if we do a bit of math, what we're going to find is that 10 homers 
works out to about 1,900 birds that weighed about 475 pounds. You ever gone hunting for birds? If you go hunting for birds, maybe you get six, maybe you get ten. But can you imagine 1,900? And here's the thing. The worst hunter got 1,900 birds. Because it says this was the one who gathered the least. And I think I had worked it out one time. I forget how many 55-gallon barrels it was. It was 10 or, or 50. I don't remember. But it was like, it was incredible. And this was just on the first day. So what did they learn about God? Nothing. The idea is that this was only the first day the quail were coming, and this is what the people were doing. What have the Israelites learned in the wilderness? As it comes to provision, it seems they learn nothing. Because they were now surrounded by abundance. If you can gather 1,900 quails, the least of them, and God said every day it's going to be there, can you just make the leap with me that God had rained down abundance on them? They were surrounded by abundance, but they were still acting like slaves in the way they were thinking, and it was revealed by what they were doing. Someone once said, it's one thing to get Israel out of Egypt, but it's another thing to get Egypt out of Israel. So it's one thing, let me translate that, it's one thing to get people saved into the church, but it's another thing to get the world out of the church. See, what's been happening in the last few decades, and I'm not saying it hasn't happened all throughout history, because it's happened all throughout history, but what's been happening in the last few decades, we've seen it, is that instead of the church continuing to declare the truth of this is the Word of God, this is what the Word of God teaches, not tradition, not religion. We know the church has been guilty of that. I've been guilty of that. That's not what we're talking about. But we're talking about the truths of God's Word. We have, instead of teaching it and recognizing that there is sin, there are things that God is not pleased with, that God does not want us doing as Christians. Instead of doing that, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. Instead of doing that, what we have done is we've said, it's okay. We've accepted... And, and let's go back to our text. We've accepted the idea that, hey, it's a slave mentality. We're not going to get rid of it. Why fight it? Just embrace it. No. That's not right. Now, we're talking about worldliness, but really what we're concentrating on today is we're concentrating on the poverty mentality and a bountiful mentality. Okay? So... In Joshua 1 and 8, it says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. What we're talking about is we're talking about the word of God, but he's talking to Joshua when he says the book of the law shall not depart on your mouth, from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night and be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then, what, what then? Now, when you meditate on the word of God day and night, and you're careful to do according to that little word, all, that is written in it. Not some. Not whatever feels good. When you do all that is written in it, then you will make your way prosperous. Now, you know, there's a lot of people today, I do it, I love the verse, I quote the verse. The, the desire of God for us is that we would prosper and be in health, even as our soul prospers. But prosperity doesn't come just because you're a Christian. Prosperity comes as we submit ourselves to doing the will of God in our life. And what is the will of God? Where is it found? In the Word of God. Right? 
I, I'm a Christian, but I don't believe in tithing. This really isn't about tithing, but it, it, it's part of, part of it, you know. Yeah, I don't believe in tithing, right? I don't have enough money to tithe. Well, you know, are you thinking in terms of a, 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 a natural mentality or are you thinking in terms of a biblical mentality? Okay? Maybe if you do things without a God to back you up, without a supernatural God that releases His power through His Word into your life as you do what the Word of God says, if you're starting, if you continue to think like people in the world thinks, you'll never have enough. And God never said, if you have enough, give. He never said that. It really, if you read the Bible, it's give and then you will have enough. Right? Now listen, we don't start out giving if you have, you don't, you don't start out giving all your check away. Now, when do you give all your check away? When God tells you to. But that's really not wisdom to begin with. Right? What you want to start practicing is you want to start practicing giving by doing what God prescribes, and that's the tithe. Tithing is our ABCs to financial blessing. Wow. Yeah, can you just erase that from the Bible? I don't want to deal with that. Well, you may not want to deal with that, but remember what I tell you. If you have a sacred cow, I'm going to step on it every once in a while. The reality is tithing blesses the church, yes. But I don't preach tithing because it blesses the church. I preach tithing because it's the will of God. And the, the church is not this building. You are the church. You will not be blessed to the extent that you could be blessed until you submit to the word of God. Well, I don't have enough. That's a poverty mentality. The Bible says, give, and it shall be given unto you. Right? So, if I make $50 a month, what is a tithe? Tithe means 10%. <laughs> Hopefully, you make more than $50 a month. I'm just trying to make this easy on us, okay? So, if you make $50 a month, what is a tithe? $5. I don't have enough to tithe. But it's amazing how many people that have $50, $100 a month, they have enough to buy whatever they want. If they have a vice, they spend the money on their vice. When you were in the world and you made $50 a month, you bought cigarettes. When you were in the world, if you made $50 a month, you still bought beer. I don't have enough. What you're really saying is, after I buy my cigarettes and after I buy my beer, I don't have enough. <laughs> right? But it's amazing how when you want something, you have enough. You have enough to buy that little toy you wanted. You have enough to buy the gun you wanted. You have enough to buy... Whatever it is that you want, you have enough. Because the bottom line is, you will, you will find a way to acquire what you value. And I guess what I'm trying to get you to understand is, when you value God, and you value the Word of God, and see what God was teaching Joshua is, don't just read the Word, meditate on it, think on it, chew on it, fill your mind with it. Be not conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The Word of God will change the way you think. It will birth faith in you to begin to believe God, to do something that you couldn't do in the natural realm. It doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up on paper. Well, we serve a God that doesn't add up on paper. You hear what I'm saying? And what you'll find is that, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, I'm going to give it a try. Well, that's what the Bible says. The Lord says, test me in this. But you have to have a different mentality than, well, I gave $5 this week and I couldn't make it this week. No, you have to look at it like sowing a crop. You have to be committed to the crop. How long does it take to sow a crop, Marty? <coughs> Four months, six months? 
okay, two months, could be three, could be four, right? So you, you committed to sowing that crop. You can't just like, well, I'm going to plant a seed today. Nah, I'm hungry. I'm going to dig the seed up and eat it. Oh, it didn't work for me last week, so I'm not going to be committed to the seed. No, you've got to be committed to the Word of God. You've got to be committed, committed to doing that. And when you do that, God is faithful. Listen, it's not the church that's going to meet your needs. It's God that's going to meet your needs. Well, how is he going to do it? See, that's where everybody struggles. I don't know. I wish I could tell you how he's going to do it. I try to figure out how he's going to do it. And I've been a pastor for a long time, and I've been a Christian since 1985. That's 37, is that 37 years now? No, that's uh, 38 years now I've been a Christian, and I still haven't figured God out. I had not figured out how he's going to do what he's going to do. But I can tell you that he's faithful. And what you will find is that you begin where you're at, doing what he said to do. But everything has to be done in faith. See, the Bible is not a formula that we work. It is, it is the principles and the promises of God that we put our faith in. We put our faith in the Word of God, not because of the Word of God, but because of the God who gave the Word. And He's faithful. Okay? And what happens is that when you find out and you're faithful to do what God says to do and you recognize the provision of God, it's supposed to change the way you think. And when it changes the way you think, you begin to realize that there's plenty. I don't have to worry about how I'm going to make the end of the month. I don't have to worry. It doesn't mean we become frivolous. It doesn't mean we become foolish. But we don't have to worry about how things are going to work out. God is faithful. And if God says, I want you to give this here, we can do it. Even if it's what we need to be able to make the end of the month. If we need this, but God says, no, I want you to give it because I have something for you. You can give it knowing that if God said to do it, he will back it up. Now, that doesn't come overnight. It comes through faithful obedience to the Lord, doing what he says and recognizing over time that God is faithful. And then it frees you to be a channel to do whatever God wants to do in your life. All right. Uh, Romans 12 and 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 6, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine powers to destroy strongholds. Where are these strongholds at? We're not talking about powers and principalities and rulers. We're talking about here. It doesn't work. I don't believe it's going to work. It can't work. I don't have it. It's impossible. It works for other people, but it won't work for me. What those are is strongholds. And Paul says the word of God, the weapons of our, our warfare, destroy arguments. Every lofty opinion raised up against the knowledge of God and takes every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That thought right there. That is not one that's going to help me to do the will of God in my life. So I've got to learn how to transform that thought into one that is kingdom-minded. That's what Jesus did with Peter. When Peter said, you're not going to the cross, he turned to him and he said, get thee behind me, you lying devil. He didn't quite say it like that. but He said, get thee behind me, Satan. What was happening? Did Peter have a demon in him? No. But his mindset, his way of thinking was not a kingdom mindset. It was a demonic stronghold. And Jesus was dealing with that in Peter's life. Because he, Jesus was telling him, this is why I came. It may not make sense to you that were born in the world, but this is the will of my Father, and I'm committing to do the will, I'm committed to do the will of my Father. So obviously the correlation for us is that we can be a Christian, going back to our text, but still have a way of thinking that doesn't reflect the God whom we serve. We can be a Christian and still have a poverty mentality. Or we can be a Christian and have our way of thinking transform to reflect the one whom we serve and who are we, be, we are becoming like. We can have a bountiful eye. We can have one because we're in covenant with a God in whom there is no lack. 
We are in covenant with the God who cares for his people. If we have a bountiful eye, it will change the way we see and the way we behave. Now listen, I'm, I'm telling you, I've told this story before, but it just, it's my experience. It's my testimony, right? Um, I'm good at some things, right? Depends on, uh, there, there are some things I do well at. And there are some things that I don't do well at. Now how many of you know, that's, that's all of us, right? We all have things that we're strong at, and we have things that we're weak at. So one of the things that I was not strong at was saving for the future. Just wasn't my gift wasn't my I had a battle in that whatever the case may be so what happened was we lived for the day we didn't live for the future we didn't live with the future in mind and there came a day where it I, I wasn't 20 anymore I'm 45 50 55 and now all of a sudden you begin to realize wait a minute what if I can't work forever what am I gonna do you know what's gonna happen and I began to realize, oh, man, I'm, I'm 55. I'm 60 years old. I can't change the path. And there's no way I can make up for it. There's no way, unless I, I have a windfall somewhere, there's no way in the natural realm that I can fix this. Have you all ever have that? Okay. So I'm, I'm lamenting, right? I'm like, woe is me. Bah. Whoa. And the Lord speaks to me. And he said, Rick, and I know, it's funny, when you, when you have a conversation with God, it's, it's usually for me, it's, an, it's inside. I don't know if it's my mind or I don't, I don't know. I just know it's the Lord. And I knew what he was talking about. He said, what's my name? Well, I'd been dealing with, whoa, I don't have enough, whatever. I said, well, your name is Jehovah Jireh. I said, what does that mean? He said, it means you're the Lord, my provider, our provider. He said, Am I your provider only when you do well? Or is my name Jehovah Jireh, the Lord your provider? Still, still very real to me. And I said, well, you're always Jehovah Jireh. He said, do I not know, and he didn't quite say it this way, he said, do I not know the end from the beginning? I said, yes, Lord. You're the Alpha and the Omega, the end, you know, the beginning and the end. He said, don't you think I would know that you are not too bright in some areas of your life? I said, well, I guess so, yeah. He said, I knew that you were going to make these mistakes in your life, and I'm still Jehovah Jireh. I don't come to you and say, well, I would like to help you, but because of the way you lived your life, you're not worthy of me helping you. You just really messed up. And sorry, bud, go find some other God. No, he said, I'm in covenant with you. And I'm Jehovah Jireh. I knew what you were going to do. And I've made provision for you. Not just because you did well, but it didn't matter whether you did well or you didn't do well. And my part of the covenant is I am your provider. And to be honest with you, I don't look at my bank account and all of a sudden I have $500,000 in there. I don't look at my uh, 401k or any, which I don't have one. I don't look at any of that right now. There's nothing there and nothing has changed. But what has changed is I have a word from the Lord. I'm going to take care of you. And that's what he told me. He's going to take care of me. He's going to take care of my family. He's going to take care of all my needs. He told me that. And you know what? I don't worry about it anymore. <coughs> it doesn't mean I'm, I'm foolish, but there's no way I can make up for everything that I've done wrong. But I don't have to, because it's not a work that I do. It's a work that he does. Well, where did that way of thinking come from? It was transformed by an encounter with a bountiful, providing God. And that's what I'm trying to get you to, to realize is that I don't have to have a lot of money in my bank account to recognize that there's going to be enough. One, one time I was using this as an, an example. I don't have to have uh, uh, $5,000 in my wallet to think that I have money. I can have $5 in my wallet. I can have nothing in my wallet. 
and still be okay. Why? Because I walk with a God who's a trillionaire, multi-trillionaire, who makes comets that are bigger than the earth, that are loaded with gold and minerals, and you don't think he has enough? And all I got to do is say, Papa, I need something. And he's committed to providing for me, right? Not for excesses, not, uh, not for that. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about, hey, I want a jag. Can you give me a jag? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about he's committed to meeting my needs. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Why do you worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear? Does he not provide for all these things? Are you not much worth much more than these? See, do we really believe that? Do we really believe that? He is faithful. Well, how's he going to do it? Because he can't do it this way because I messed up. You think you limited him? You think he has no way of being who he says he is? You don't think? One time he said, I, I believe he said, I've made provision for every situation that you were ever going to encounter in your life. It's already been made because he knows the end from the beginning. Do we believe him? If we believe that, then we're beginning to see through a bountiful lens. But if we don't believe that, older you get in life, man, I don't have as much. I got to I got to hoard. I got to protect. I got I I and instead of being a be better giver because you know more more God more, you become a less of a giver because you're protecting yourself more. All depends on the lens that you have. Last point. What does a bountiful eye do? Whoever has a bountiful eye will be blessed for he shares his bread with the poor. How's, how does a righteous person with a bountiful eye behave? A person who knows that there will always be enough is free to give what they have, knowing that Jehovah Jireh will continue to provide for their needs. And I, I, I already used the scripture, Matthew 6, 31 through 33. James 2, 14 through 17. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. When we come to a place where we recognize God as provider and realize that there is no lack in the kingdom, we've begun to see through a, a new lens. We can now live life through the perspective of a bountiful or a generous I. doesn't matter how much money you have. You can be generous with a little. You just trust God. As a result, we can freely do what God desires, knowing he is faithful. Luke 6, 38. Give, and it shall be given to you. Good measure. Press down, shaken together, running over. It will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So, let's say you are generous, but you give a little. You're, you start out giving with little thimbles. That's your measure. When God gives back to you, what measure is he going to use? A thimble. Let's say that your faith grows, and you begin to give in a cup, measuring cup. You begin to give more, but you use a cup to give away. How is he going to give? What measure is he going to use to give back to you? A cup. Let's say that your faith is growing, and now you start using a pitcher to start giving away, and you start giving away pitcherfuls. Then what measure is God going to use to give back to you? A pitcher. Let's say your faith grows, and now you start getting the biggest, the, you know, you're like, man, God is so faithful. I want to start giving more. And next thing you know, you go get, uh, what do you call them, uh, uh, es uh, the excavators? Yeah. yeah, Yeah, you get one of those. You start filling it up, and you start... As the Lord leads, obviously, you start giving that away. What's God going to use to give back to you? That's really what the Scripture is teaching. Now, the context is, if you give away forgiveness, you're going to get forgiveness. Right? If you speak peace, you're going to receive peace. But also included in that is, is your attitude towards helping other people out financially, whatever the case may be. Give, and it shall be given to you. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8, I think this is the last scripture. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will 
also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also sow, will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I'm always reminded of John Brayton. Uh, he says, God loves a cheerful giver, but he'll still take it from a grump. Anyway, no. <laughs> and God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Now, I'm not promising you that as you become generous and you begin to have a bountiful eye and you begin to be a giver, I'm not promising you that you're going to be able to look in your bank account and have thousands of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars. That's always possible. It's not, it's, it's, it's not beyond imagination that God will do that for you or for his people. But that's not really the goal. The goal is that no matter how much I give, I know God is going to provide what I need. And therefore, I can be faithful to give. Am I making sense to you? All right. What we're dealing with is not how much is in your bank account. What we're dealing with is here. So what we learn today is the person who has an outlook on life that sees through a bountiful eye will behave in such a way that reflects that out outlook. So to recap, whoever has a bountiful eye is someone who has the understanding that with God there is plenty and there is more than enough. And because of that understanding, he or she is free to share what they have with those who are in need without fear of lack. Mm -hmm.